so much to EBBF for the kind invite to speak today. I'm Josephine Lau, Executive Director of the Serica Initiative. I'm originally from Hong Kong and have been based in New York City for almost a decade. Now today I'm going to start my story in the spring of 2020. As I imagine was the case for many of you, last spring was one of the most harrowing periods of my life. My father had been visiting me in New York from Shanghai, where my parents work, before COVID hit. When it became clear that New York City was going to be a major COVID epicenter, my father and I had two choices, neither of them ideal. One, either my dad would lock down with me in Manhattan as a man in his 60s with respiratory issues, and frankly, as someone who really doesn't like to follow the rules. Or two, he'd have to fly back to Shanghai, where COVID was already relatively under control in the spring, but with all the risks that taking a 15-hour flight entails. When I think back to the spring of 2020, I think about how threatening the world felt on both a personal and a global level. Globally speaking, countries were closing borders to protect themselves against dangerous pathogens from abroad. And on a metaphorical level, political leaders were rallying around a growing sense of nationalism. Here in the US, COVID-19 became the China virus, the Wuhan virus, Kung flu. China became the dangerous, dirty other. And so did the Chinese people. I was also acutely aware as an Asian person of the increasing number of attacks that were happening on Asians in America. And on a professional level, for me, US-China relations has always been a common thread in my career, whether in um, my work as a journalist in another lifetime, working as a lawyer, or now working in philanthropy. The state of the US-China relationship was worse than it ever been in my lifetime. And I think this closing of borders felt especially acute to those of us who are so used to crossing them. As I imagine many of you in this audience are, I'd been so used to going between borders, whether that's literally going through customs between countries or working and living between different cultures and going back and forth between different languages. The question I asked myself was, what do we want to hold on to when the world is closing itself off in so many ways? What is our vision and what is our responsibility? And honestly speaking, last year, a big part of me wanted to close myself off from the world to stay in my little safe cocoon. And I did, did that when I needed to take care of myself. But ultimately, I decided that for people who share in EBBF's values of community, of dialogue, of understanding, we have an even greater responsibility than ever to keep the metaphorical borders open, to convene, to connect, especially at moments when it seems difficult to do so. As I mentioned, I'm currently executive director of the Serica Initiative, a New York-based nonprofit. Serica's mission is to build education and dialogue between the US, China, and the rest of the world. In particular, within this mission, Serica is especially focused on the nexus of business and social impact in the US-China space very aligned with EBBF's mission to grow responsible business. Over the course of the last year, with growing nationalism and a difficult geopolitical environment, I found it valuable to think of my work through the conceptual framework of translation on four different levels. One, translating between the US and China. Two, translating between the world of business and the world of social impact, three, translating between the generation currently in power and the next generation of leaders picking up the mantle, 
And finally, translating between spiritual values and living them in the workplace. When I took the helm at Serica last year, the question I posed for myself was, where do you even begin to find common ground to work when two countries seem to be disagreeing on pretty much everything? In this case, the lesson I learned about translating between the US and China was to pick our battles and to identify areas where collaboration was still feasible. For Serica, this meant honing in on areas like philanthropy and climate change. Two, translating between the world of business and the world of social impact. As this audience knows all too well, the business world and the nonprofit social impact world speak very different languages. In translating between the business and nonprofit worlds, the lesson I've learned is to be precise in defining what we're talking about. What I've learned is that practitioners in the US and China can view these practices and concepts very differently and have very different motivations in pursuing them. For example, in the West, I think ESG is increasingly incorporated into investing strategies to boost returns. Whereas in China, ESG is still primarily seen as a way to manage investment risk. It's important to be precise in pinning down concepts and motivations, especially when working between sectors and between cultures. Three, translating between the generation currently in power and the next generation of leaders. In thinking about intergenerational and economic transformation in China, it's important to remember just how quickly everything has changed. China's economy opened up to the West in 1978, just over 40 years ago. This means that the economic growth that took centuries to happen in the West has been compressed into just four decades in China. So imagine if the US economy had gone from robber barons to impact investing in just 40 years. What I've learned about translating between generations who are working in the US-China space is to look for new ideas in unexpected places. Traditionally, in Western discourse about social impact, there can be a focus on what the global South can learn from the West. But in China's case, and I'm sure in cases around the world as well, China has become a hotbed for experimentation and innovation in everything from sustainable agriculture to venture philanthropy. And in my work, I make sure that these learnings go in both directions, between the West and the East. When change has taken place so quickly as it has in China, and there aren't centuries old models to follow, China has done a lot of leapfrogging and is trying completely new things that are outside existing models in the West. And there's a lot to learn from that. And finally, last but never least, four, translating spiritual values and living them in our work. I know that at ABBF, we're people of many faiths, or many who don't belong to a faith tradition at all, but we're united in our desire to ground ourselves in ethical and moral values, to act from those values, and to make a difference in our work and in our communities. Someone told me recently that for her, as a person of faith, it's not her desire to propagate the content of her faith through her work. Instead, this partner of mine at work, she told me that she aims to infuse spiritual qualities into her work and into her interactions at work. For me personally speaking as a Baha'i, it's about applying the Baha'i principles of unity, equality, and the independent investigation of truth to my work in US-China relations. I started this talk by describing how claustrophobic 
and how despairing I felt about the U.S.-China relationship in the spring of 2020. What I've learned since through my work at the Serica Initiative is that I can make what small contribution I can, even in a relationship as tricky as U.S.-China relations are at the moment, even in a world that seems increasingly closed off to other opinions, other generations, other nations. I've learned that I can make a small contribution through the conceptual framework of translation and by showing up to do that work of translating every day. Translating between countries, translating between cultures, translating between sectors, translating between generations, and translating between the values that ground us and our work lives. The writer Anthony Burgess once said, translation is not a matter of words only. It's a matter of making intelligible a whole culture. It's this work of translation, literal and metaphorical, that gives me hope and vision for the future. Oh.